Um, and we are recording here now. Oh, great. Okay. Well, hey, Peter, thank you so much for joining me tonight. Yeah, Seth, thank you. Thank you. And what, what an important and uh, I hope auspicious moment in human history. Uh, this is like no other. It really and I, uh, yeah, I, I, I do a monthly video through uh, Yale Climate Connections, Yale University. And I was talking to my editor this morning and I said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, bud, uh, but I've been paralyzed, mm. paralyzed by this election. And he said, you're not alone. You know, I'm hearing that from everybody. Everybody is, we're all up late at night, doom scrolling on Twitter and, and we can't sleep. And, and, you know, we're grasping at every poll and, and every, you know, bit of news that comes out. And I, I think that the uh, debate last night might have helped because at least those are over. Mm -hmm. And now it's just a uh, rush to the finish line, but, um, but it's, this is, this is unprecedented. It's just unprecedented. It really is. It's, it's such a confluence of um, intense experiences and, and um, you know, polarized um, propaganda bubbles and um, in some cases, end times ideologies. Uh, and it's all of us are grappling with a lot right now and it's getting intensified. So I'm grateful to be connecting with you in this moment to be able to share this with folks. Um, and so, yeah, it's always, I've always learned a lot and felt inspired when I hear you speak. Um, appreciate your voice, all of your diligent research, you know, uh, all the work that you've done. And it's amazing to me when I, when I get to know people like you and Bill McKibben and different folks who are devoted to learning more about the reality of climate change, all of you are folks who are caring individuals looking to learn about something that isn't even in it's it's like you have no stand to benefit from it personally it's not a narrative that's being constructed for personal benefit the the propaganda that you're up against is constructed for the benefit of the fossil fuel industry and those who are put in power politically by the fossil fuel industry those interests and so i just have so much respect for for your efforts you know through the years to continue to find creative ways um to tell the truth and so that people will hear it and you and I spoke, you know, a few weeks ago uh, about this moment that we're living in, and I was really inspired by what you had to say. And and here we are. It's it's October twenty third right now. We'll be airing this on Sunday, so the twenty fifth. But last night was the the last presidential debate, and and they covered climate change at the end of it. And so I'm really curious to hear your hot take on what you heard last night. What stood out to you? Well, the overall uh, most important overarching story is that climate change uh, had its own segment at the debate. Uh, it, it didn't fall in there by accident. Uh, we didn't have to beg to have somebody ask a question about climate change. Uh, uh, the journalistic community has finally gotten it. And, uh, and apparently the polling is clear enough now that uh, politicians and, and, and the political community now understand that this is something you have to talk about uh, because uh, uh, there's still a few holdouts out there, but overwhelmingly people believe that we have to deal with climate change. And that goes across Republican, Democrat, Independent. Uh, I'll talk about some of the polling that I've, that I've seen on that. But, um, and, and it's, uh, it's really an interesting, this has been an interesting year for me because as we've talked about, uh, I have, I, I've been so fortunate as to have uh, spent a number of summer field seasons with scientists working in the Arctic. And so for like six years running there, I was going to Greenland uh, on and around the Greenland ice sheet with science teams. And, uh, and then of course, COVID happened. And I was 
expecting to go actually to the Arctic in April uh, and uh, to a place called Svalbard, but of course that got canceled. And then, and then uh, weirdly enough, climate change kind of came to me because we had this disaster right in my backyard um, in, in Midland with the failure of two dams and the draining of two pretty good sized lakes into the, the communities below. And uh, I was uh, very fortunate and I, I was not uh, uh, directly impacted by that, but, but it, it, it's a disaster that I've been talking about for a while because we've been seeing these increased uh, rain events here across the Midwest. And, um, and so our infrastructure is no longer keeping up. And, and now with the fires and everything else that has happened through the summer, very intense hurricane season, um, climate change is kind of coming to everybody. And uh, it's, go it's going to impact you, you know, if it hasn't already. And I don't think just because you don't live on the seashore or live near a forest that could burn uh, that you're not going to be impacted, you are. And that's kind of sinking in for everybody. And I think it reflected that last night. I wasn't terribly pleased with Joe Biden's uh, responses on that. Uh, on one hand, uh, some people were cheering that he said, we're going to see the end of the oil industry. And that's good and that's a breakthrough and somebody had to say that you know but he left the way that he said it left it open to the interpretation that you know the democratic party is going to end the oil industry or joe biden's going to end the oil industry you know and the fact is the oil industry is on its way out and i wonder you know i will watch i think a video that that will make that somewhat clear uh the last time around, it was the coal industry. Mm -hmm. And 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 Donald Trump said, I'm going to save the coal industry. You're going to be working so hard in the coal fields. You know, don't worry. Well, the coal industry has actually been collapsing more rapidly under Trump mm -hmm. than it was under uh, Obama, who supposedly, supposedly had a war against coal. And that's simply because we're at an inflection point in technology and history. And uh, just like iPhones drive out landlines, renewables and, and for the moment, uh, natural gas are driving out coal. And, um, and we're at a moment now where oil and gas are now next. Mm -hmm. And uh, you may remember a decade ago when there was supposed to be some kind of coal renaissance in the state of Michigan. There were like something like nine coal plants on the drawing boards for the state of Michigan. And none of those got built. But those of us that were watching closely uh, could see the writing on the wall, you know. And, and I had actually had, a, I had lunch with a high ranking utility executive at that time. And I think the only reason he had lunch with me was because he thought maybe I was going to be organizing some kind of opposition to his coal plan, you know? And I told him, no way, <laughs> I'm not gonna oppose you. That, it's just, it's crazy. I'm not gonna do that to my family. And, and moreover, I don't think I have to because I think you missed your moment. And I explained to him what the economics of, of the natural gas and the, new, and, the, and the renewables coming on were going to kill coal. And, uh, a few months later, they canceled that plant. And uh, I don't know if I had anything to do with it, but certainly if they started looking at the economics, uh, that it was the big reason. Uh, and now we're seeing the same thing with natural gas. Mm -hmm. And so and so, my advice to, to Joe Biden and so to Democrats is to say, look, this transition is happening. You know, it's going to happen no matter who you elect, but the question is, do we want the United States to lead it? And do we want to, to make sure that we, we take care of those communities who are being 
adversely impacted as these industries that they've relied on for, for so many generations are, are going away, you know. And uh, uh, the, the COVID crisis is, is crushing natural gas and, and oil, uh, fracking for oil, shale oil in the United States is being crushed. And, um, and at the same time, Russia and the Saudis have decided they're no longer, they're not going to allow the price of oil to rise high enough to make American shale oil profitable. They've been satisfied to allow that for several years, but now they're thinking, well, why should we? These, these guys are starting to cut into our, our action here. So, uh, so Joe Biden needs to say, look, uh, the oil industry is under a whole lot of pressure that's not gonna go away from foreign producers, but electric vehicles are happening too. So the, the heyday of the oil industry is over. You know, Exxon has been dropped from the, the, uh, the Dow Jones averages. You know, it's been dropped from the Standard & Poor's top 10, you know, for the first time in 100 years. Uh, and, and replaced, by the way, by a, uh, by a, a renewable, a, a carbon-free energy company, Nextera. So, um, so these things are happening. What can we do to, to make sure the United States uh, comes through this as a leader and also to make sure that our, you know, our, our workers, our people uh, can, can transition successfully as well. You know, you got tens of thousands of, of uh, people with uh, great experience in the fossil fuel industry. Uh, and if, if they can't find jobs, if they can't get back to work, we've got work for them mm -hmm. uh, capping the hundreds of thousands of orphaned frack wells that are out there throughout the country leaking methane and toxic gases into the atmosphere and, and substances into the water and stuff, they have the skill to, to get right to work on it, you know. And I believe that's part of uh, Joe Biden's plan. He should be talking about that, you mm -hmm. know. And uh, I, just, I just think that the the Democratic Party's been so used to play, kind of playing defense uh, uh, on, on uh, climate change that uh, they haven't quite formulated their, their sound bites. They haven't quite crafted them so that someone like Joe Biden or Kamala Harris can just reel them right off like they can with so many other things, you know. But, uh, but yeah, why don't I, uh, we talked about uh, doing a little share screen here. Um, and so uh, I want to show you what, what I have been doing this summer. Uh, here we go. Right. And you should be seeing some, some wind turbines. Um, I spent my summer uh, documenting the construction of of the Isabella County uh, wind farm, Isabella Wind, which will be the largest uh, wind farm in the state of Michigan when it's completed. And I just want to give you a sense of the scale and the uh, massive engineering that goes into this. And uh, this is quite interesting because these people in Isabella County have been watching their neighbors in Gratiot County over the last decade, uh, Gratiot County has had very successful wind development and now all of their neighbors, north, south, east and west are starting to opt in and say, yeah, we, we think we wanna do that too. And so it's inspiring to see this community kind of come together uh, in spite of, you know, there, is, there are fossil fuel uh, fake grassroots uh, pushback against this. Take a look at this. Uh, at the very top of this turbine, see the little guy? 
just to give you a sense, you know, there's a little guy on top of there who is spotting for that crane operator who's bringing that giant uh, blade assembly across there. Uh, that's a drone shot that I got uh, just a few weeks ago. And I think it, it speaks to the, just to the scale and the, the expertise that these guys have. Now, this is, we're in Shiawassee County now. Shiawassee is the site of Michigan's largest solar farm so far. There are many in the pipeline. And this I shot just as they were beginning to hang these panels. Uh, you can see they have these racks uh, lined up all very geometrically ready to begin to hang the, the panels on. And then um, I went back just a few weeks ago to this same uh, general area. And you can see that the panels are, are, are all hung now. You can see they have, uh, they have configured it to, to align with this uh, creek that runs through this field here. And you can see the power lines in back. So they, they uh, uh, cited that next to power lines. And so it's uh, one of the biggest unreported stories in the state right now is the uh, huge scale of renewable energy that uh, both solar and wind that is being, uh, that is in the pipeline that has just been completed and that is being planned uh, for Michigan. Michigan's become somewhat of a hotbed uh, for, uh, for renewable energy. And, uh, and I'm, I'm excited, uh, but we need, we need people to know about it. And we need people to know that um, it doesn't just happen automatically. We're almost in a kind of a guerrilla warfare uh, with these, uh, uh, AstroTurf fossil fuel funded, fossil fuel organized groups that they organize through Facebook with bogus, you know, factoids and, and fear and, and intimidation. And they will, uh, they can stop a project by intimidating uh, a few township boards in, uh, in, in key areas, you know, and, and getting, uh, unfriendly zoning ordinances. And so uh, we need people to kind of be aware that this is happening in our communities and come out and support because by far uh, uh, the, uh, the, the vast majority of Michiganders support uh, clean energy development. And we need to always keep that in mind. There's, there's a very small vocal uh, minority. I'm, I'll show you a few more of these um, little slides here, um, just to uh, just just to give an idea. We had we had uh, cost uh, or energy price uh, data come out just this week, and this is the this is the gold standard. This is from a Lazard, which is a interna international accounting firm. And here you see the prices for uh, the most important forms of new electrical energy. And you can see uh, solar and wind are now the cheapest. Uh, the, the lines that are closest to the left of your screen, uh, that means cheaper and more to the right means more expensive. So uh, the cheapest wind projects are now the cheapest new electricity in the world. Solar is very close. Gas is still competitive, but it has challenges. Uh, and you can see uh, how the price of solar has plummeted 90% over the last 10 years and uh, wind 70% over the same amount of time. So uh, this isn't something we need to do to be, to be good human beings or, or to be progressive, uh, it turns out that it's actually cheaper to save the planet than to burn it up. You know, uh, at, at least for for most of us, it's it's not the favored uh, it's not favored for the, the coal barons and the oil barons. But uh, here's an example of some of the polling data, and I and I got this just this morning. 
from a group of uh, conservative Republicans who are starting to understand climate change and they're starting to understand uh, the clean energy imperative. And their polling data uh, tells us that it's almost unanimous across the board uh, support for the government taking action to accelerate and develop the use of clean energy. And you can see these three bars on the right hand side, you've got uh, uh, 90% support among Republicans, almost the same among independents and uh, near, near unanimous, 97% among Democrats. So you, just, you don't see those kind of numbers uh, in polling, I'm sure you realize. So, um, so phenomenal uh, uh, public support for all this uh, uh, good, Good development that we're seeing, but but it, it the 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 resistance is still there, and they can still slow us down. And that's why it's so important, uh, in my estimation, that that we elect Joe Biden, because um, uh, we've seen. I think a lot of people maybe haven't understood in past years the importance of the courts. Uh, that is something that is playing out in front of us. And, and uh, there is potential that uh, uh, the 1% the, the oil oligarchs will try to use the courts to stop climate action, to stop renewable uh, energy. Uh, and they're in a position to do it if, if we don't push back very strongly in this election, which means, you know, uh, essentially electing Democrats and progressives all the way down the line. You know, uh, it's so important that we, uh, that we send a, a, an absolutely clear signal. And um, so I, uh, I guess, I guess what, I, what I wanna say to people is if you, if you think your vote doesn't matter, you know, maybe you think that Joe Biden wasn't my favorite candidate, so I'm I'm unhappy. Or Joe Biden's climate program is not strong enough, so you know we're we're doomed. There's nothing we can do. I would say, in fact, we are a generation of human beings that has more leverage over what's going to happen in the future than any other previous generation of human beings. And the next fifty thousand generations of humans. Are, are they can't speak to us, but they are relying on us. Their eyes are on us right now. And um, this is this is one way that everybody, everybody can, as it were, pull that pull a lever. You can, you can you can put yourself on record in favor of a positive future. And and because of COVID. Um, we're in a position that nobody would have imagined a year ago. Whereas uh, uh, a year ago, you would say a goal like a massive restructuring of the economy towards renewable energy would be a fine aspirational goal, but hard to see how we actually get there. And now because of COVID, it's actually become mandatory you know, there's no longer a choice about whether we're going to spend the money and whether we have to rebuild the economy. We're going to do it. You know, the question is, what's it going to look like? You know, the question is not whether the money is going to be spent. It's going to be spent. Uh, but it won't be spent optimally and we won't move quickly enough if we don't put the people in place who at least make that conversation possible. And uh, uh, Bernie Sanders and AOC have, have injected a, a whole lot of very important ideas into that energy plan that Joe Biden has. Uh, he's, the, the money that he's talking about spending and the, the particular policies that he has in mind are very much in the ballpark of what we need 
what we have a recent study from the University of California that says if we can do this, we can get to 90% carbon free by 2035. And we can do it and, and lower our energy prices at the same time. And we and 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 the the resources that they're talking about are very much in the, in the same ballpark that the Biden campaign is is now talking about, because they've been emboldened by just that the world has changed in six months. We're in a different we're in a different universe. So I was thinking, um, I I'd like to I'd like to. Uh, play a couple of short videos, five, six minute videos that address that. Uh, and the, the first one uh, deals with this, um, this idea of uh, what an impact uh, COVID is having uh, on energy, uh, on our energy future and uh, just where we are. So uh, let's see if we can cue this one up. And this is uh, this is from my uh, uh, my Yale series. This is not cool. This is the the series is called This is Not Cool. Love it. And uh, and you can see that right. You can see a black screen. Yeah. And we will now play. Before the pandemic. The oil industry and the natural gas industry are already in serious stress, serious stress. So there was already plans underway to begin canceling major infrastructure projects like pipelines, right? So Kentucky killed two pipelines. People in Kentucky killed two pipelines before the pandemic. Um, there were pipelines under stress out west, as we know. People like myself already saying this is an industry that's in its last days. Uh, it's just getting hit from too many sides. Um, and then COVID-19 hits. Certainly the coronavirus pandemic has represented a uh, challenge to the industry that no one could have predicted and that no one's quite sure how it's gonna turn out. The number of drilling wigs under, uh, under activity were, was starting to drop. Then the pandemic occurred and the oil industry has had the worst body blow in its modern contemporary history, right? We know that. The, the growth in demand for oil has been on a steady downcline decline for the last decade, but most precipitously in from 2017 to 2019, the growth in demand uh, just was cratering. At the same time, price for oil was cratering. With the coal industry, um... I think they've borne the brunt in the electricity sector of the downturn, which has been, you know, between five and 10%, depending on what market you're in. Uh, and, you know, coal is already the most expensive unit on the margin in general. Um, you're not going to see less dispatch of solar and wind, which is zero marginal cost. So most of the new electricity generation coming online today is coming from wind and solar. The cheapest energy projects anywhere in the world last year and the year before and the year before were all solar or wind projects. Producer countries and producer companies, producers that were making less and less money for their product, but they still needed to make the same amount of money. So they needed to produce much more. So all of that contributed to a massive supply glut. Again, before COVID. <laughs> I saw a report from Wood McKenzie, one of the major uh, data uh, tracking firms, and they're predicting that this could be the inflection point for uh, fossil fuels, where we may have seen peak demand for oil and natural gas. That's the crazy thing about the U.S. fracking industry. They, they've they never made money. The, the, the fracking industry was already way overextended, um, and I think this is going to be a reckoning the, the market can't support the continued expansion of that industry. So they have lost $300 billion, $300 billion over the last decade. The only reason why those companies were able to keep producing is because they were underwritten by banks and hedge funds, government subsidies, and other financial institutions that were essentially making money off of their loss. Exxon is not a gold standard investment like it was 
30 years ago. Those pr prices for those stocks have been going down and are much lower than they were at their peak. You know, fracking has always rode on the coattails of OPEC saying, we're gonna charge two or three times more for oil than what we really need to charge. And when fracking cut into that market share, when it started stealing you know, market away from Russia and Saudi Arabia, they decided to let the price drop to 40. I don't think they're gonna let the price go much higher than 40 and fracking only makes money at 55. So, you know, that basic math means that the North American oil industry is gonna have a really hard time operating. Coal mining families in Kentucky believe fiercely that they built America, right? They were the people that built the pyramids, right? That's the way they think about it. And that, and that the nation can't abandon them for putting their lives at risk for all those years to build this industrial powerhouse that we have. So I'm really sympathetic to that view. I was at our car plant on Wednesday night of last week, second shift in the control room with our power plant operators. Their lives are being affected by this change. Please don't forget that. One group of experts says this is a blip. You know, the industry will come roaring back, the wells are gonna be turned back on, and drilling is gonna continue, we're gonna export oil, and other other experts say, no, 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 this is, this is a total change. This is a body blow that is gonna take years. How do we accelerate our, our uh, exit from these uneconomic assets? And, and how do we support the communities that have relied on the royalties and tax revenues from those resources. For every dollar invested, you get many more jobs out of solar and wind and infrastructure and storage than out of fossil fuels. In fact, it's a factor of two to three more jobs per dollar invested in infrastructure and in renewables than in natural gas, oil, and coal. These are generational trends that have the capacity to make life fairer, more just, less punishing for the environment, right? And better and more prosperous. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, so, um, hang on, let me turn off that sound. Yeah, thank you so much for this, Peter. It's, uh, you know, you're hitting on all the topics here. It's like you're getting into the reality of of the way that the narrative has shifted. And it's been dramatic over the past several years in terms of the viability of, of renewables. And just nauseating and grotesque to hear a sitting president spew these lies about how wind and solar are not viable. It makes absolutely I know. sense. And so it's yeah. happening no matter what. But I think I really love that you hit on the fact that administrations are responsible for appointing people to positions of power that are enormously significant. There are you know, hundreds of, of positions within the federal government that will be appointed. And we have a person running the EPA right now who's a coal lobbyist, right? <laughs> we have... <laughs> We had people from Exxon right in the inner circle of, of government four years ago when, when this president was elected. And, and so, right. um, and of course, you know, it's great to hear Keith Schneider, who's a, I, I admire Keith and love talking with Keith and he helped start the Michigan Land Use Institute, which is now groundwork and has gone on to do great things in, in journalism with the Times, the New York Times and, uh, you know, all this work in Washington and I love that he's talking about not leaving the workers behind, you know, how it's, it's right. like times are changing and, and, and that's going to happen no matter what, but, um, but to be considerate of working class people and my, you know, I have, I have uh, law enforcement and veterans and I have all these minors in my lineage uh, in the UP. Right. Right. And right. And so just to see, and then, you know, I come from a very conservative county, Misaki County, uh, okay. 74% red in 2016. 
uh, and there's a big, there's a solar farm down in the south side of the county that is very popular. And you, right. you, know, you talked about how we need to get out ahead of this face, fake grassroots, you called it, which I think is yeah. exactly it. It's, it's industry funded um, efforts that pop up in social media is ripe for this kind of stuff. Um, they come in and they basically tell lies to local government. And uh, we've seen that a lot with Enbridge influencing local chambers and, and local uh, commissioners um, with, you know, deep pockets and, and mobilization on the ground. But I've heard you talk about your experiences when you go in and talk to township boards and you do these more rural presentations. And there are case studies of rural communities benefiting greatly in recent history all across Michigan now where schools are there's an influx of money tax revenue and schools right roads get fixed um, stuff that people sheriff patrols sheriff patrols fire rescue uh, you know Emergency. trash collection you know our, our rural areas have been hollowed out you know by the same forces that have hollowed out some of our cities here in, in the Rust Belt and so when you go into the rural areas uh, now, it's almost the same story that you would have heard in some of the urban areas in the 80s and 90s. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's drug abuse and, and joblessness and, and uh, food insecurity, you know. Uh, but uh, the excitement that people have when they start to see the benefits that these projects can bring is, uh, is really inspiring. And, and very important, uh, we have some real cultural divides and disagreements in this country uh, in the age of Trump, but one of the most creative and constructive and respectful dialogues between opposite sides of the spectrum in the country is going on now on this issue of, of renewable energy. And, and actually some of the, the most red, the most Trumpy rural areas are actually some of the most successful areas for renewable energy development uh, because they have, uh, in part because they have a very strong sense of, of uh, property rights. And in other words, if I want a wind turbine on my property, by God, I should be able to put it on there, you know? And uh, that is one of, that is a very, very strong uh, uh, impulse that, that is in our favor. And, and, and now solar, we're seeing some of the same things. And I wanna, I wanna speak to uh, an issue about solar is that when you, you see those big solar fields and uh, sometimes people will say, oh my gosh, they're covering up a bunch of farmland with, with solar energy, you know. Well, it's important to understand that right now about 30 to 40 percent of all the corn that we grow in the state of Michigan goes for ethanol to eventually be put into cars and burned uh, for fuel. Now that's about the, the most inefficient possible uh, conversion of solar energy into, into fuel imaginable because the conversion of sunlight into, into corn biomass has an efficiency of about 1%. And then you've got to send it to the refinery and then it's got to you know make its way through the chain and make its way from the engine to the wheel and you end up with probably negative uh, efficiency on that whole process. And yet you have this industrial farming using a tremendous amount of land to do that. Well, EVs are coming, ethanol is eventually gonna go away. Uh, producing solar energy uh, has an efficiency of about, even middle of the road solar farm efficiencies of about 20%. So you're already 20 times greater and you're converting directly into electricity, which is a high, high quality form of energy that goes immediately out onto the grid to be used. And so, uh, so consumers energy 
we're going to talk about more in a minute, Consumers Energy has a very ambitious solar uh, program, uh, something like 7,000 megawatts of solar plan, which uh, if that is fully en enacted, that would require less than 1% of Michigan's farmland. So we're actually, you know, uh, we're creating uh, more revenue and more opportunities for farmers to, to keep their farm productive, keep it in the family, keep the farmers in the community, uh, keep the rural uh, character of their community and be a part of the, the clean energy industry at the same time. So uh, very important that we understand that. And, and the woman that you saw in this last video is Patty Poppy. She was talking about the, the workers in her uh, in one of the coal plants that's going to be shut down here in Bay City. And she has actually become uh, somewhat of a nationally significant figure because she is steering our largest utility, Consumers Energy, in the direction of renewable energy. They have committed to uh, cutting 90%, uh, uh, becoming 90% uh, less carbon uh, by 2040, 2040. So that commitment now puts them in the ballpark of the most uh, forward-leaning uh, organizations in the country. I, I, would, I would argue still not quite good enough, but pretty darn good. We can work with that. And so uh, I, wanna, I wanna show another video that talks about Patty Poppy and some other uh, far-sighted utility executives here in the Midwest that are really pushing this transformation. So, so uh, that will also be another one from my uh, my uh, Yale series. So, let's see here. Yeah, here we go. You know, post-World War II, electric demand was, was at a huge steeping, a steep incline. Farms were being electrified. Factories were coming online. We were fueling the, this great economy. And we needed to build plants as fast as humanly possible. And the, the reliable, affordable fuel that was available widely was coal. And it did its job. But the formula has changed. The coal fleet in the U.S. is about on average about 45 years old. And that's about getting to the end of their lifetime anyways. And when we built a lot of these things in the 60s and 70s, you know, we had to build these massive plants to get the economies of scale to make electricity really cheap as electricity use was growing and growing and growing and growing and growing. Demand flat at best, and if we do our job, it might even decline the actual per capita usage can go down as buildings are more efficient, lighting's more efficient, HVAC's more efficient. We all know that. So given that, we have the opportunity of a generation to determine with what will we replace these big central station baseload power plants. We will replace them with modular renewables because it's smarter. What we've seen in the past, especially two or three years, is a recognition of the impact of falling prices for wind, solar, and storage across the country. If you don't have certainty in your demand curve, you don't want to take a big bet and overbuild a big power plant. And actually, without the increasing demand, that's just a cost that we would all bear. If we're going to build a gas plant, it's going to be 1,000 megawatts. That's the minimum like efficient size. And so that's, that's the way we used to have to think about it. We don't have to think about it that way now. Whenever these utilities go you know, to the capital markets to look for these things, it, it's, it's hard to fund a gigawatt scale plant anymore. And we have you know, cheaper alternatives and smaller pieces. 
And so if we can modularly add renewables, and we can, we can modularly add those renewables to match demand more timely. At the right time, we can add the supply. We need two megawatts at a time. Wind and solar are the cheapest form of energy available to us and in the electricity system in the U.S., full stop. To be honest, 10 years or so ago, when wind was first being developed in the upper Midwest, it was a very disruptive resource for us. Uh, we weren't very good at predicting when the wind would blow. The transmission system really wasn't up to par to handle the intermittency of the wind. And <clears throat> quite frankly, it was wreaking havoc with the economics of our baseload coal plants. So we didn't, we didn't like it much in 2005, 2006 timeframe. Fast forward to today, we've gotten very good at predicting when the wind is going to blow. The transmission system is, is able to handle the intermittency uh, of all of this wind. It has no emissions, it has no variable costs, it's relatively inexpensive. What's not to like? Colorado, where I live, where Excel here is able to buy new wind and solar for less than the cost of continuing to run its existing coal plants. Situations like that are showing up even in Midwest, where Northern Indiana Public Service Company made a similar announcement and is procuring uh, wind and solar to a similar end now as part of its new resource plan. In the past, you would see that natural gas has been extremely competitive in the resource that you would want to select. But when you start competing and you see cost declines on these renewable resources, you now see them being chosen over these long-term natural gas units. Everybody in the world has, has consistently, for the last 10 years, underpredicted the price declines in solar in particular, but also wind. And now we're seeing that happen with lithium ion storage as well. In the past, we've tended to think of our baseload resources, our coal resources, as baseload, and every other resource being supplemental to that, regardless of what it was. Well, that's been turned on its head now. I would suggest to you that wind is quickly becoming the new, the new baseload. And to be viable going forward, all other sources of generation must be flexible enough to be supplemental to the wind. Kind of an exciting thing right now. And you get your mind around that, it makes a lot of sense what we start doing with our other assets and other resources and why we're still com we're so committed to the wind. So, there you are. Very good. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, so it's amazing, right? It is. Uh, uh, is is that new information to you? You're a pretty uh, tuned in guy, but for many people, this is a huge surprise. It is, yeah. You know, it is a it is a surprise to many people. Thanks, in no small part, to you. You know, I try to stay up to speed to this, uh, to speed with this stuff. Um, but uh, it it's refreshing, and it's it's information that needs to circulate more. Right. Right. You know, so it's a nice so, uh, to, the, to the doom scrolling that we're all uh, <laughs> leaning into it, these days. Exactly. Because, you know, we're 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 at such a, a point of such uh, such huge, such a huge uh, energetic significance that can really it can tip either way. It can tip very strongly either way. And, and it largely depends on, on what we do. And, and even, you know, God willing, we, if we win this election, there's still going to be a lot more to do. You know, there's still going to be the, 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 the import of the election is that it just creates the opportunity for us to really push forward strongly on this. Uh, nothing, nothing is guaranteed here. Uh, and we've we've all got a lot of uh, a lot of work ahead of us to 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 make this come out right. Um, but uh, but okay, so uh, I I, I want to talk about some more stuff, but I don't want to bore anybody. So uh, how do you think we're doing on time here? I think we're doing great. You know. Uh -huh. Yeah. I okay. Think this is fantastic information and 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 it's 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 something that comes up for me peter is like an example anyway of being passionate about 
you know, people are passionate about protecting the earth and our future. And this is a systemic uh, threat to our very existence, climate change. And um, I've been working in water for a lot of years. And so, you know, um, the Flint water crisis, the Detroit water shutoffs, the continued use of line five are all of these things that have been uh, crises that have taken place in recent history in Michigan and before these this past election, um, you know, we ran into so many roadblocks with the Snyder administration, not just roadblocks, but they actually created and perpetuated the, uh, these crises and made it easy for Enbridge to keep doing business here, have a tunnel, you know, and uh, emergency management, right. absolutely disastrous. And so it's like, there's sometimes when you're working in a, in a lane, you have to pivot. And so um, I know a lot of different activists and grassroots organizers, community organizers um, veer in and out of how much time they're spending on electoral politics. And so the, the fact that this is such a powerful moment to be involved with electoral politics is also because of that, because the administration that we're working with is not workable. There are no, there, you know, the people who are put on the inside to protect the environment and to look, be forward thinking about our energy needs are exactly the wrong people to be doing that job. Right. And so right. I, I, I'm wondering if you can speak to that a little bit more in terms of, because you touched on it earlier, how some people, and it's true. I mean, if you look in both parties, you can find corruption, you can find, you know, corporate collusion with elected leaders. It's grotesque and we've seen it, you know, um, we've seen fascism take place in both parties. But if you could speak to that, how this current administration is not workable and you look toward a Biden administration as being more workable. Well, this current administration is uh, obviously um, the closest thing to a, a straight up fascist uh, uh, a government that we've ever seen in the United States. And uh, a, a, another, another term for this administration, I think just about everybody agrees would, would change this country for the for the worse, and perhaps permanently, and and uh, uh, I I I told a colleague uh, shortly after the 2016 election debacle that um, some people are going to die because of this, and at the time I wasn't sure how it was going to happen, but I said people are going to die, and if it's only a few thousand people dying, we will have dodged a bullet. Uh, and I, I did not foresee COVID-19, but uh, here we are. And um, the, the potential for this scale of, of, of mismanagement due to ignorance and greed uh, is, uh, I, I think, people have not thought very much about just how huge uh, uh, an exposure we have in, a, in an interconnected technological world to threats like COVID-19. But also there are many others out there and climate change probably being in my mind the, the, the worst, but uh, there are many others. And we have to get, uh, uh, we may have our di disagreements with both parties, but in, in, in normal times, there is a certain amount of, of professionalism that is generally, uh, is generally expected uh, of, of any party that is in power in this country. And this particular administration has completely broken with that. And it just seems like a no holds barred uh, uh, race to, to, to loot uh, the country uh, as rapidly as possible. So, um, and, it's, and it's really, a, a, uh, this, is, this is a Vladimir Putin view of the world uh, in which the strong muscle out the weak and, um, 
and gain power and gain wealth simply by crushing those who are who oppose them. And um, and science has no value other than uh, other than if, if it can further uh, uh, power and technology. But uh, but we we have to get back to understanding that there is there is objective truth in the world, and that science is one of the most powerful tools we have for establishing that. And 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 objective truth is a huge threat to a government that relies and depends on simply following the directives of the strongman, you know, regardless of, of the facts and the truth. And, and, and that's what we see playing out in the COVID dynamic is uh, it's everything has been to service the, the agenda and the image of the strongman rather than come to grips with the reality that's in front of us. So uh, I want to, I want to, if I, if I may, I have, I have another video that speaks to uh, how the financial, the, the financial industry has kind of awoken to the the impact of climate change, and this is really, this is really kind of an important development because. Uh, uh, Money is now starting to flow away from fossil fuels and towards renewable energy, not because of anybody's uh, good intentions, but simply because this is where this is where the money is to be made. This is this is uh, where the technology is going, and uh, those that want to uh, uh, to prosper are are having to move in this direction. So it's it's pretty significant. And uh, again, I think it's something that maybe a lot of people still are not uh, aware of. So I want to uh, uh, sort of make that connection for people. And um, here we go. So let's try this one. Thank you, Peter. Some big news from BlackRock this morning. The company CEO, Larry Fink, his annual letter is out and the world's largest uh, asset manager now announcing the firm will make investment decisions with environmental sustainability at its core. In that letter, Fink writes the following. He says, the evidence on climate risk is now compelling investors to reassess core assumptions of modern finance. And in the near future and sooner than most anticipate, there will be a significant reallocation of capital. And I was thinking about all the different crises we've dealt with in my in my career. And it, it, it's very clear to me the physical changes that we may see with climate change are more permanent. We can't, we don't have a Federal Reserve to, to stabilize the world. This is bigger, it requires more planning, it requires more public-private uh, connections together to, to solve these problems. And I do believe many of these problems could be solved, but the actions have to begin now. I would say we're in a climate crisis, um, just like a financial crisis, where uh, action needs to be taken. Now, this is a slow burn crisis, if you will. Um, so it's, it's, it's more difficult to act. That's part of the challenge. When I meet with younger investors, with the Robin Hood people, with people who, who trade, millennials, they ask first, well, is the company just spoiling the environment? Americans believe climate change is real and that number goes up every single month. They believe that it is man-made and that number increases every month and that both political and business leaders need to do more right now to address it. Today, Microsoft leader Satya Nadella laid out a bold mission for the world's largest software company. We must begin to offset the damaging effects of climate change. Now Microsoft is announcing a moonshot promise to make that happen. Today we are making the commitment that by 2030, Microsoft will be carbon negative. Microsoft doesn't want to just become carbon neutral. They want to actually negate their carbon footprint going back more than four decades. Microsoft will be carbon negative by 2030. Uh, and, and what that means obviously is, is that these 
These guys are putting the hammer to everybody, suppliers, themselves, whatever's necessary to basically reverse what's going on for, for hundreds of years. And I think they can do it because, remember, they are a powerful force, maybe the most powerful, uh, when, especially when it comes to data centers, of almost any company on Earth. So I think they can make an impact. I think this is real. This is not greenwashed. I mean, I think it's something like, what, 10 EV models that are expected to launch this year? And now we've got these reports about GM uh, relaunching the Hummer as an electric vehicle, too. All electric. Zero emissions, zero limits. Hummer EV from GMC. We're tracking over 100 uh, um, vehicles that are being introduced to market that are full battery wow. electric. So that, that's kind of the wave that we're seeing, or tsunami in, the, in this case. In the next 18 months, two years, the price of an electric uh, vehicle, like for like categories, is going to drop below that for a gas-powered vehicle for the first time. And it will continue to fall because we're riding down the battery cost curve decline. Since the 1980s, the number of weather-related loss events has tripled on an inflation-adjusted uh, basis. Insurance losses from these events have increased from around $10 billion per year uh, during the 1980s to around $50 billion annually over the past decade. From floods to droughts and wildfires, the threat of increasingly extreme weather to homes is clear, but the risk to the mortgage market of a climate foreclosure crisis is just now coming into focus. Some say all of this should be a wake-up call to the nation's banks and mortgage lenders. You have a trillion dollars of real estate at risk in coastal markets. It's about time you start paying attention to that. But the challenges currently posed by climate change pale in significance compared with what might come. And the far-sighted amongst you, and we know this from a survey we've just done, the far-sighted amongst you are anticipating broader global impacts on property migration political stability, as well as food and water security. Your letter effectively suggests that long-term fossil fuels will not be a good investment. We believe in most cases fossil fuels will not be a good investment. Once climate change becomes a defining issue for financial stability, it may already be too late. I'm done with fossil fuels. We're done. I mean, big, big pension funds saying, listen, we're not going to own them anymore. I wrote it in mind to, as the world's largest asset manager, to, to try to inform more people of where we believe asset allocation is going, where we believe um, the world of finance is moving towards, and we all need to be better prepared. And I, it's actually kind of happening very quickly. It's going to be a parade. Uh, it's going to be a parade that says, look, these are tobacco, and we're not going to own them. So there. Awesome. Great work, Peter. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you I, for sharing this with us. And yeah, this is compelling stuff. And it's it's it heartening, you know, to see the, the private sector and big tech uh, not only, you know, driving demand. And you see that in Iowa and, and in Grand Rapids, for that matter, of right. big tech companies saying, we'll come here if you have a solid renewable grid. And exactly. cities are changing their grids so that big tech companies will come there. And, uh, exactly. and you know, to hear uh, Fink from BlackRock and, and Jim Cramer himself just basically putting the nail in the coffin, just hammering it in. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, so, so, you know, we are not powerless. Right. Uh, you know, some maybe sometime in the future we'll talk about where things are in terms of climate change. But just in in a nutshell, you, you we, all is not lost. Mm -hmm. We're going to see some very serious impacts. There's no getting away from that. We're seeing them now. Yeah. But we can avoid the worst impacts. And and the this is so important. The the biggest area of uncertainty. When you, when you look at the graphs, uh, mapping out what the future might be, and there's a huge spread of possibilities out there, the biggest uncertainty is what will humanity decide to do? We are still the biggest control knob on this, by far, okay? It is not out of our control. So, uh, so this is the moment. So if you have, if you have voted, good. Uh, if you have friends 
or family that have not voted, get them out there. Uh, it, 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 is, it is not hopeless. It is, uh, it is not useless. It is anything but. It is the most powerful thing you can do at this moment. And there's hardly been a more critical moment uh, in human history. Well, thank you so much for your time, Peter. You bet. You bet. Uh, and thank you. Thank you for your time and your work. And uh, I hope we can uh, continue to, to have a conversation. Absolutely. And, and uh, you know, the folks watching who might not be familiar with your work, where can people continue to follow you? Uh, well, uh, Yale Climate Connections uh, is where I publish a lot of my videos, uh, but I also have a blog, uh, Climate Denial Croc of the Week, uh, climatecrocs.com, uh, where I, you know, kind of make uh, snarky comments on a daily basis, and, and I hope informative, uh, a lot of pretty, pretty good scientists and uh, others follow me there. So um, that's a good place. And you can contact me through there as well. So uh, don't, if there's anything that I can uh, add to anybody's uh, conversation or their community, I'm, I'm happy I'll be there. Great. Well, thanks again for your time and uh, we'll be seeing you down the road. Okay, man. Really appreciate it. Thank you. You bet. You Take bet. care.